And I'm saying hello and welcome everyone to the Critical Making Mentoring uh, Project. Uh, and to the next teaching session. And I'm very thrilled uh, that Bahar Kumar is uh, joining us today to teach us about uh, how we can build for continuity. Bahar is uh, one of the, um, ah, you're already showing a presentation, that's great. Um, so Bahar is the executive director of Impact Hub Kathmandu and also one of the co-founders of um, the organization that was before um, uh, Impact Hub Kathmandu Communitaire Nepal and a long-term gig member as well. So a member of the Global Innovation Gathering. And I'm handing over to you to teach us all about how we can actually build for continuity. How can we build sustainability into our projects and organizations? Thank you so much, Bahar. And this is your virtual applause. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Great. Thank you for having me. And um, it's really always a joy to be connected to the Global Innovation Gathering community and family. Um, partly because we are such visionary impact makers. And so being part of the critical making sort of project and program is a real privilege, I think, because we're really making some transformative change. You all are building transformative change. So today, what we're going to talk about is exactly that, building for continuity, for sustainability, so that our products and projects have a life uh, that lasts for as long as it needs to for the people that we're designing and building for. And so what I'm going to do is, um, Sandra also shared that, you know, we were an organization called Nepal Communitaire, and then we recently became Impact Hub Kathmandu. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do at Impact Hub, and then I'm going to share with you our story of sustainability. And a lot of times these journeys are really powerful learning moments where we can recognize that in order to bring people together and recognize your value, you kind of hit a point of crisis at times. And so I'll share a story around our journey as well. But just to give you all a glimpse, first of all, how many of you have heard of Impact Hub or have connected with an Impact Hub in your community? You can just raise your hand, just kind of curious um, if you have. Um, but basically these numbers are a little bit outdated because um, we also recently joined the network and I think now we're in 108 locations and in over 60 countries have loads of members and programs, but really it's a global network that's focused on building entrepreneurial communities. And the whole uh, sort of idea is that through entrepreneurship, it's one way of building impact at scale. You know, so it's also sort of like, how, how can we do good in this time of real need in our world? at scale. And one of those ways is through entrepreneurship. And so at Impact Hub, um, what's really nice, and this is recent data, is that they're make, we're, we're making an intentional effort. They're making an intentional effort to grow throughout the global south. So nearly 50% of the hubs are now in Latin America, parts of Africa and Asia and other cities and countries in Central Asia that still sort of are defined as sort of developing countries. And that is really important in today's context, especially when we're going to talk about who do we want to bring in to our movements around impact with our products and services, because a lot of times it is, you know, sort of donors and funders that are sitting up in Europe, but the impact hub is really trying to make sure that that exchange happens by having a voice and a balance. So those resources can really um, support the work that critically needs to be done, let's say around climate impact um, in the global south. So this was, you know, so we're really proud to be one of those hubs in Kathmandu, connected to a lot of other hubs throughout the country where we can sort of pull from models that maybe not, you know, ones in Europe may not make sense to us all the time. So that's been quite nice. Um, what some of the things that we provide is around innovation, collaboration, and building these impact startups. So some of these things are really critical to sustainability and continuity. So building a collaborative community, that's one of the pillars of the work that we do. Um, and then 
entrepreneurial support is around how to create a business model around those initiatives. How do we generate some revenue so that it survives and has a life? Um, and the way we do that is providing physical space of gathering to bring different thinkers, community members, and people together to support some of these powerful projects. And then there's a whole ecosystem, right? There's a bunch of different players, and we'll talk about those from donors and investors to our clients and customers and users, and who are all those people that we're going to map that are going to support the work that we're doing and make sure that it does have uh, continuity. So these are some of the ways that we support these impact entrepreneurs. And many of us, we were just talking about UNDP's Accelerator Lab, but the SDGs in many of our countries are a way for us to measure some of those impacts. So it's a nice way for us to kind of figure out, hmm, are we building sort of the change that we wanna see in our countries? And one of the ways through impact enterprises is that in a lot of our countries, it's, it's the fastest growing sort of um, sector within SMEs, small and medium enterprises. And a lot of entrepreneurs now have a vision to create a business model that also has social impact. And that's why it's so important that we figure out a support system to make sure that they survive. They're creating new jobs in our different communities. And it's a significant part of the GDP. Uh, so that's why these small, medium enterprises and impact enterprises are quite important. So I'm going to share with you our story of sustainability, because everybody has a story, you know, whether it's a personal story, a, a story about a movement, the, these are alive and real, and they have their ups and downs. And so for, for us, in order to honor kind of where we are today, we really think it's important to reflect where we came from. And so we started as an organization called Nepal Communitaire, and we started after the 2015 earthquakes in Nepal as an organization that came to work with communities to provide disaster relief. And through that process, and I was not part of the founding team, I was a user of this space after it was established. But what, what they were sort of exploring is, hmm, how are people in Nepal approaching problems? problem solving? Uh, what are their resources? What's their capacity? What's their vision around it? And so what happened is um, as they were working with communities, they realized, wow, there's a real appetite for thinking differently and entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship was on the rise. And so what happened is they then took that sort of momentum and said, we're going to create a hub. We're going to create a space that then says, how can we bring these change makers together to redesign and rebuild our community after a disaster. So it was like the earthquake was a catalyst for innovation. It was an opportunity to say, hey, let's redesign and rebuild our country differently. And there was already some of that work happening before the earthquake. And what, what Nepal Communitaire said is, hmm, Let's see if we can harness some of that thinking to really unleash it in a way that we can redesign the community. And this model started in Haiti. So there was Haiti Communitaire after the Haiti earthquakes. And then there was a, a model that was also launched in the Philippines and then Nepal Communitaire as well. And so what happened is, um, you know, our vision in Nepal was to kind of prove that Nepal is a land of possibility and opportunity for innovative entrepreneurs. Many of us come from countries where we're suffering from a brain drain. All of our talent is leaving. Migration is a bit of a crisis in a country like Nepal, where we don't have a lot of opportunities for our bright, bright um, young people. And so we wanted to say, no, 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 there is opportunity for you. That was our vision at that time. And this started back in 2015. I was a user of the hub, fell in love with the concept, felt the energy, felt the fire. And I said, mm, I wanna be rooted to something like this and I wanna be a part of this movement. Um, and so this is what some of our wins were. We started community movements, we started projects, we engaged with people, we started a community garden. 
a march for clean air because air quality was really and still is a huge problem in Nepal. We had town hall meetings with the decision makers, our local mayors to, to advocate for policy. So this is how we were starting to look at um, engaging community to make real impact uh, for ourselves. And this was quite exciting. So we immediately were working around mobilizing our community. And then we had a crisis because, you know, a lot of visionaries and, you know, impact makers are doers. We're doers and we're just driven by our commitment to build, um, you know, sort of positive change for our people. And so it caught up with us. And we were sort of, you know, our resources were running low and we didn't have a business model. You know, we didn't want to be driven by donors. We wanted to be different. We said, no, we want to design our own vision and mission and do it ourselves. We wanted to be self-sustainable, but we didn't, we didn't have, we didn't have a way of bringing money in to cover what was going out. And we didn't know how we were going to make that money to sustain ourselves. Our expenses were going up and we didn't have a way of bringing in new resources. And we were really on the verge of shutting down. Uh, we just did not know what to do. Uh, we were at a bit of a crisis. So what do you think we did do? What do you think we did do? I'm curious. You can unmute yourself, take a guess or put it in the chat box. Any guesses? No, no guesses. Well, we went to our community and we asked them because we thought maybe, oh, there is something in the chat box, workshops. We were doing workshops. We were doing a lot of this stuff, but we felt bad asking people to pay for the workshops because we just assumed, oh, I don't know if people are gonna pay for this stuff. And, and so we, we really struggled to figure out um, and we did, we had to develop a business model. Um, but what we did first to even start developing our business models, we asked our community, our, the people who are already engaged in the work that we're doing is, do we need a community-based hub like ours? Are we relevant? Are we necessary? Uh, what do you use us for? Why do you use us? And, and what gap are we serving? And so we went back to those folks and they said, you are absolutely necessary because there's no community-based hub. Everything is sitting at a university or in a government institution and nothing is as innovative and exciting as the spaces. And this is what this space is contributing to the work that we're all doing. And we didn't quite know that. We were just so busy doing it. We hadn't heard these stories. Um, and so then we strategized as a community around how to remain open. And we realized that there's there actually are a lot of resources out there that we just weren't tapping into. And that's when we got our first sort of donor funded project. We had champions that saw the value we were adding and said, we're here to ensure that this doesn't stop and that this continues. And so today we had, so since then, now this is, we now have a Fab Lab. We have the Fab Lab Nepal. We had, folks come into our space and recognize that, oh, we needed more equipment. We needed more resources for our innovative change makers. And so the Fab Foundation came in and said, asked us, would you host the first Fab Lab in Nepal? And we were quite nervous about that possibility and opportunity, but then we asked our community, we, we held town hall meetings and we said, should we do this? And they said, yes, because this equipment does not exist here where we can have access to it. It's either a corporate setting, it's an industrial factory, or it's a high-end university, and we don't have the equipment to be creative and design and, and, and produce prototypes for these uh, solutions that we're designing for our communities. So we said, okay, let's, let's bring in the Fab Lab. And we got funding for it from the Fab Foundation. And we worked really hard with a lot of people to bring in all this amazing equipment. And now we have the Fab Lab Nepal. That happened during lockdown. Well, just after lockdown in 2021, we were finally able to bring in all the equipment. Um, 
And then in later in that same spring, summer, I think 2021 was really our year, we got invited to become part of this global network called Impact Hub. And so Impact Hub Kathmandu was launched just in about like February of this year. And we were not sure if this was the next step for us. But when we again brought people together to find out, does this make sense? Do we need to move in this direction? People said, yes. Now we're ready to connect globally, to pull learnings from all these different people just like us to co-create and really amplify our impact so that it goes beyond our borders. And if we're looking at some of these complicated and complex you know, sort of problems that we're facing in today's day and age, it really does require a lot of collaboration across really different sort of groups. And so for us, it was so exciting to become Impact Hub Kathmandu because now we are able to really pull in lessons learned and take um, best, you know, sort of toolkits and best practices and adapt them and roll them out for our community. Um, and so for us, it took hitting rock bottom and really actually asking ourselves, are we really necessary? Are we really meaningful? Do we have a value? Um, and the people we went to was our community. Um, and what we're going to do today is look at how you can engage different parts of your community to ensure that your projects and your products are sustainable and that they continue. Um, any reflections on that story? Does, uh, does that resonate with any of you and what you may have gone through or are going through with some of your projects right now or your organizations or yourselves as individuals? Um, hi, thank you very much. This is a very informative um, session, and I love that you've actually spoken to the challenges because sometimes everything is talking about the good and what you're doing, but it's very informative and helpful um, what was shared right now. And yes, we are going through that home where um, the engineers say, look, we will need a whole lot of money to make this a sustainable thing for the next 20, 30 years. And so we are looking now at ways to make it sustainable so that we can move forward and make it, a, a, like you say, a lifetime thing, a long time thing, uh, um, entrepreneurship uh, with a social impact. So thank you very, very, very much. Yes, great. Thank you so much, Helena, for sharing that, because I think that's exactly why we're here today, because um, we're going to look at how you can bring champions on board to support uh, the impact that you're creating uh, and so that it, and how to align what you're doing with the same priorities of other groups as well. Great. But again, it's about when you hit those low moments, go back and ask people, hmm, are we do, is our purpose still relevant for the folks that we're designing for? Yep. Okay. Sandra, did you have something you wanted to say? Nope. No, thank you so much. Um, that's great. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, so what are the pillars of sustainability through that story, through that experience is really it's about community. And we can define community through a variety of different folks, you know, variety of different people and groups that we're trying to engage in our products and our, in our projects. So I'm gonna start with a couple of them. One are our customers and users, people that are actually buying it because they need it right? People that are, are paying for that. And that can look very different. It can be an individual, it can be an organization, right? It can be, we, we can talk about a lot of different customers and users, but we need to figure out 
who is going to actually pay for our product or our service, right? Those are our clients, right? But sometimes clients can be large corporate clients, donors, organizations, entities that you're providing a, a significant service for, a value for that's meeting a real pain point. Like if we're designing something for caretakers, should we look at facilities where caretakers are so that we can look at what we call B2B models, business to business models, which are wonderful ways to kind of test some of our products and services in a rapid way. If you just engage a couple of businesses that are willing to, to try out your product or service and give you some meaningful feedback. So those are sort of, I call them clients because you're gonna design those relationships a little differently than doing individual consumer, customer, and user marketing. And for many of us, we're, we're in countries where in Nepal, the donor international development and funding sort of organizations are an industry and a monster of theirs, of, of, you know, on their own. And the reality is, is that if they are part of our community, we need to leverage them as stakeholders and champions in the work that we're doing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we structure those relationships so that the power dynamic is not such that they're, we're asking them for money, but instead we're inviting them to join our cause. Because you have to understand that donors and funders, they have to deliver on a mandate. And they're looking for amazing partners and people to deliver on their mandate and their, you know, sort of cause, like all of you. And it's just about how to sell that with integrity, passion, and credibility so that they say, oh my goodness, yes, let's do this. So let's do this, not can you do this for me or can you do this for me, right? So it's, it's, so we remove the transaction out of it and create instead a real authentic partnership. And if we do that really well by positioning ourselves as experts, you're going to have actually quite a few champions that will be willing to support your, support your projects. So these are the folks that kind of help bring money into your organization. Now, part of your community are also those that are helping to build it, right? So it's your team, it's your engineers, it's, it's your, you know, your designers, developers, your vendors and suppliers. You know, these are all the people that you are investing your resources in. Those are also folks that are part of your community. So when you're kind of wondering, oh, the evolution of your projects, are we relevant? Are we doing this the right way or the wrong way? These are two groups that you need to constantly be in conversation with because they'll give you wonderful insights. You cannot do this work alone. You, you have to engage these voices and say, look, we're wondering if this is how we should move, if this is if we need to pivot, if we need to add more services, if we need to adapt, because we talk about the design thinking process and being relevant and iterative, it's all based on input from your community. And they will tell you, if you ask the right questions at the right time, people will be honest with you. If you're open to honesty, people will be honest with you. So one of the things is you have this whole group on the left side, your customers, your donors, clients, those are the folks that are bringing money in to your project. And then you have those that, you know, where money's going out, you're investing those resources. So with impact entrepreneurs or social enterprises, we're looking at a balance between the two. So you're gonna hear a lot of people talk about scalability and profit and all that stuff. And I, I really just ditched those, <laughs> those terms because, we're doing such valuable niche specialized projects that it's not about scaling, it's about true impact. And what all we wanna do when we talk about sustainability is survival around balancing the money that comes in and the money that goes out. You know, if you can manage your growth slowly and mindfully by constantly balancing this out, you're doing beautiful. And that might mean you have 100 customers and you have three team members and you're able to produce, you know, a few hundred products, whatever it is, you'll know what the numbers are. And as your demand goes up, you'll figure out how to grow slowly. 
a lot of times with entrepreneurship, there are these really fancy words around scaling and return on investment and you know, all this fancy stuff. No, we just talk about surviving and balancing, balancing the money that comes in and the money that goes out. It's actually quite, you know, I, it might feel oversimplified, but really that is kind of what it is. You know, it, 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 I, thank you for that heart. I need it. Yeah, Ricardo, right? It's really, that's what it is, especially for us that are, you know, just really out there to do good. We're not really driven by making lots of money. I just need to make money to make sure my team is taken care of, that my vendors are being paid for so I can continue making products for my people, right? So this balance is really your business model, okay? So if you've got this figured out, you've got a business model. And that means that your donors and your funders can be what we call investors. If you want to engage with investors, you can. But these are all the people that believe in the impact that your product is making so much that they're going to put money into it. You know, and so, and that's your business model. It's a plan for what we call making profit, but that profit is really money that's going to help you run your business so that you're not taking a loan out and going into debt all the time. You're not constantly stressed out about how to survive as a business. So, and if you're making great money and you're making profit, great. But what you're going to do as a business is you're going to reinvest that most likely into your community and, and or into your products, or you're gonna say, oh my gosh, my community, my users, my customers need even more. So now I'm gonna take what I've made and build them an additional product or add additional services and features that they need. So that's how we work as impact entrepreneurs. We're constantly wanting to reinvest and not in our pockets, but into our impact projects. So that's what we're going to talk about is just understanding our business model today and do a little bit of mapping around who would be the best champions to help fund the work that we're doing and how do we make sure that we've got the right people on our team. And have any of you sort of played with that process already? I'm just curious. Has anyone thought about, hmm, if I had to ask someone or an organization for to join this and, and help fund this, have you thought out loud about mapping that out? And if not, it's okay, because we'll take a little bit of time. Hopefully, you, maybe you can have like a clean sheet of paper with you to jot some notes, because if you... If, if things pop up into your mind as we go through today's session, please jot them down. Um, and then we can we can figure out how you can, you know, sort of uh, have a conversation with some of these with some of these folks. Okay, so any questions so far? Anything unclear about that business model I was talking about in a very simplified way? Something in the chat box. No, no questions? Feel free to unmute yourselves or type into the chat box at any moment. We'll keep this quite open and casual. That's how I like to connect with folks even virtually. Okay, how many of you have seen a Lean Business Canvas or have worked with one of these tools or any of these gazillion canvases out there? Okay, great. I see one hand up. And was it, who was it that had their hand up? Would you like to share what your experience was when working with this canvas? Who was it that? Hello, this is Anna from Quito, Ecuador. <laughs> Hello, uh, Anna. <laughs> how are you? Nice to Good. meet you. Nice I to have, meet you. My organization is related to education for conservancy and um, and for sustainable development. Um, for us, it's kind of difficult to think on a product as something like material because some of our products are more services. 
And, uh, and another thing is that we work uh, in territories with population in poverty situation. So most of our clients are donors. Um, but we are rethinking on um, how to develop products and also uh, to attend other 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 populations uh, with kids and most of the kids are um, accompanied by their mothers um, so this kind of education opens. I have seen this link before and since we don't have as I told you a product as something material sometimes it's difficult for us to develop as a service um, and I think this is this this lean it's always changing it's a kind of um, this Japanese um, method uh, which is called how do um, uh, I will I will remember soon, but for hey us, guys, it's or... been, it, I don't remember now this, yeah. uh, <laughs> but it is something that it's changing all the time. I remember yeah. w when we have been in worship is something that it's not what it's happening now. It's not going, it's, this is not a forever method. I remember that, but for us as a in, in Spanish, the organization is called Aprendizaje en Movimiento. It's um, learning in motion. So we are all the time changing, but we would love to have a business model in which we're not only de uh, depending on the funds of donors, but to rethink what, uh, even when it's a service, what's the product. Right. Yeah. So you touched on some really, really valuable points about any of these canvases. And one of them is that they are dynamic tools. So it's not an exercise to just fill in the box and leave it, but it's actually an exercise to help you understand, hmm, where are my gaps in understanding all of these different components to, 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 to sort of build my business. And one of the things is a lot of times we do feel like there's a focus on product delivery and product design, but this can be used for service design and delivery as well. And so a lot of times, even with products, there are services that are attached to our products that we're delivering, whether it's, you know, training on how to use it, troubleshooting, follow up around maintenance. So a lot of those things are part of what we call your value proposition. You know, it's it's what you how you're bringing value to your customers and your clients. And I don't know if you, I think some of you are familiar with the human centered design process, but that value proposition can change as your users, as your communities, as your human center changes and evolves. Because that's one thing we know about today's day and age is human behavior and preferences are rapidly changing because our environment is rapidly changing. And so if we're constantly in touch with what the needs are of our core users, then we can adapt and iterate what we, the solutions that we've developed. Um, and so, so let me, I'm looking at what Helena said, have considered what you said and have this been reaching out to champions. This session is helpful. Thank you for that. Oh, Great. Okay. Yes. Ikigai is the method. Yes. Um, so, and CC4D, so community creativity for development, you've also sort of used this canvas. And one of the things that I, I just want to want to say, and we'll go through it a little bit quickly for those of you who haven't used this, and maybe those of you who have can also pipe in into the chat box or unmute yourself around lessons learned when you've done this. But if you look on the bottom right hand, uh, bottom left hand corner, you'll see some numbers. There's actually a process to filling out this canvas. And one of the things is, so we're just gonna go through this a little bit in a rapid way. So the first one if you is the problem. 
And what I do is actually, I do my problem and my customer segments almost together because your customers are also informing the problem that you're addressing. So when you're designing, it's, you know, you're making stuff that's meaningful and relevant for your customers, then you really want to outline, okay, what are the main problems that I'm addressing for them? You know, am I making work easier for them? Am I reducing their cost around something? Am I building efficiency? What is it that, what is that core problem? And if you can just put it in two, three bullets, and it's, ma it's mainly those urgent, most critical, most biggest, what we call pain points that you're delivering for your customers. And the people I like to start with are what I call, the, they, they have early adopters right there under customer segments. It's those people that are going to jump on using your product immediately. You know, they, start with them because then you could do a whole new canvas for donors because donors can be your customers. You're delivering a valuable service to the work that they're doing as well. And if you structure that relationship as if they are your clients, like you are a consultant and they are your client, you will treat it with a level of professionalism where you will position yourself as the expert and they will hopefully listen to you and design that partnership with your guidance. And that is your intention. That's how it should be. And that means that you're also going to take what they're going to give you and use it as an investment rather than as just a donor fund, rather than as free money. And if you do that, we, you will stand out from all the other people that they're giving money to. Because that's what we do. That's what we did at Nepal Communitaire and at Impact Hub. And I was shocked at the amount of donors that kept coming back to us because they said that the way we designed our partnerships were different. And it's because we drove the partnership more than asking them and having them drive it. But what I'd like you to do is think about your end user, your customer, the one who's really going to use this and what are the key problems that you're really addressing for those users, okay? Start with that. And then the third thing is your unique value proposition. And a lot of that has to do with sort of looking at, you know, what, how do you convey that you are unique and different from everything else that's existing out there? You know, so there's a lot of ways that people are coping with their challenges. People are innovative inherently. We know how to survive and cope in a very challenging world. But how are you? making, how are you unique and different to the way that they're already living life with those challenges? That's your unique value proposition. And that takes a little bit of time to tease out. So you don't have to have it figured out right now. A lot of times this comes out after you're in the market for a little bit and you've tested your product with a few customers and you ask them, what did you like the most? What, how did this help you in the most significant way? And, and I just start writing quotes. And that becomes your UVP, your unique value proposition. And that goes on your you know, concept note. That goes up on your video. That's your testimonial. Because they're like, oh my gosh, I've never felt so alive because of this, this, and this. I never felt like I could write again. I didn't think that I had a voice. You know, you're all coming up with so many amazing solutions. And that's what you, and you want to know why, what is it about this product of mine that gives you that experience? That's your unique value proposition. So I always, when I don't know an answer to one of these boxes, I go back to my users. I go back to my community because they will tell me, they will tell us what we're doing for them. That's so meaningful. So we did this when we were about to close our hub. We said, hmm, are we meaningful or relevant? Why and how? And they gave us very specific answers. And that's when we knew, wow, nobody else, there's no hub out there that's community-based that allows for these bold change makers to bring their crazy ideas out into the public. And they said, nobody, nobody will listen to us. Nobody, we don't have a space to do that. And I thought that was, that was valuable. Um, and then the next one is your solution. Once you figured out your problem, the folks you're designing for, 
and how this is so useful, then you can sort of articulate what your solution looks like. What is it? What is it that you're, is it a, is it a device? Is it education services, right? Because people are really struggling with understanding how the climate is changing at such a rapid rate and why is it that we're not able to cultivate the same crops that we were able to before. Like there's a real crisis around food security. So it's making those connections um, to say, this is, this is what we're doing because we have to do this with urgency. And so you wanna create a solution that really addresses your problem in a solid way. And again, it's simple. You know, it's, a, it's like a lay person who does not know technology, does not know your sector should be able to follow this and go oh, okay I get this it kind of fits right the fifth one is channels so channels is actually how are you going to now connect your users to your solution maybe it's through a clinical setting maybe it's through schools maybe it's through after school programs maybe it's through um, a faith-based community, maybe it's through farms or grocery stores or markets, you know, what are, what are the ways in which you are going to connect your main customers to your solution? And I would really, really challenge you to not depend on social media so much and technology and devices, because you really have to understand where your customers are going for inf information. A lot of times we, if people are using smartphones, we ask them, what are the top three or four apps on your phone that you use every day? That's where they're going. Where are they getting their news from? You know, what are they watching? Who are they listening to? And you just want to make sure you embed your sort of services into those existing channels rather than just launch a campaign on Instagram when no one really is on Instagram not your customers at least. So you really need to figure out what channels your customers are using and integrate your products and services into that same approach. So if you're looking at donors being your paid customers and clients, you're not gonna launch a TikTok campaign. You're actually going to understand how are donors connecting and making partners? Maybe it's through inviting them to your Space, showing off what you're doing, doing a demo, you know, sending them a pitch deck, a concept note, you figure out the process and that's the ch channel to make that connection. You know, stop me at any point if you have questions. The next one is around the revenue streams. Now what you're going to do is that whole sort of side around how you're bringing money in and now it's around how are you monetizing? How are you generating money? And what I like to do in the beginning is I actually like to set targets. So I say, hmm, I'm going to do this lean business canvas for, let's say, the first six months or the first one year of my product launch. You know, and I say, I really want to hit like X number of I want to produce this many products and I want to sell it for this much. So my revenue streams are selling my product. Maybe you're charging for a certain service or feature, trainings, um, maintenance, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, those are the, the revenue streams is how you're making money, okay? How you are generating income for your business. And then the next is your cost structure. So here, again, this is not super detailed, but it's just about making sure that balance is there. So sometimes I do a map out, I just bullet out, okay, this is how I want to make money and I kind of need to generate this much. And then I look at, well, how much is it going to cost me then to produce 100x, 100 products or train 50 schools? How much is that going to cost me now? I have to, and I list just my core costs, rent, salaries, materials, you know, and I just lump it up and I just kind of play with those numbers and see, okay, no, I have to do this in order to make this, to balance it out. So your core cost structures. And if you haven't launched into the market yet, you start doing a little bit of research. How much does it cost for me to hire a part-time designer or an engineer's consulting fees? You know, if you're pay paying daily rates, how much do I need in order to produce this amount or, or provide this many services? 
And so then you can start kind of seeing what you have to generate as far as revenue. I love this one. Key metrics, especially for the lean business canvas is really, I feel like it's just a wonderful way for you to make some decisions about, about your product or your project. Key metrics are things, simple numbers that you can start tracking that lets you know how your enterprise is doing. So it might be oh, the number of um, info calls that I get, the number of donors that respond to a concept note, the number of products I'm able to produce in one month's time, because maybe you have a huge demand and your challenge is, how do I keep up with the production? So depending on your needs, like what, sometimes people are really focused on doing their marketing and their channels. So they are sharing how many testimonials we can capture in six months time. So the key metrics are simple bullets. I would say like four or five, sorts of data points that you can track that says, mm, this, this tells me what the health of my business is. It tells me that demand is going up. It tells me that, oh, people are looking at the work that we're doing. We're gaining visibility. So it could be a marketing metric. It could be marketing or communication metric. It can be a production metric. It can be something around sales. It can be something around cost. So sometimes these metrics change depending on the stage of your business. Just like Anna was saying, this is not something that you just do and you leave it. You're, we have it big up on the wall and we revisit it because as we're learning more things, we have post-it notes and we tack on more things. We remove more things. We have team meetings around this so that our business model is constantly relevant and it's constantly alive. And we're constantly adapting and it, be, it makes it more fun. So the unfair advantage is something that, you know, it, it's because you all are working in such an innovative space. It's, it's basically like, what is your, what is something that you can sort of copyright patent? Like it's, so even when we're talking about education services, it's your curriculum. Maybe it's your brilliant trainers that nobody has, you know? Maybe it's, it's your content, it's, um, it's a champion. Maybe you have a donor that loves you, like UNDP is, is committed to supporting you. That's your unfair advantage right now. And so it's, it's basically something that can't be taken away or caught. Maybe you have a brand ambassador, you know, who is basically like that, that's your unfair advantage because you're like, wow, I, we have this person championing our our project and our product um and so so the and those things may come later right because you don't even know what it is right now maybe you have a brilliant design team you have the most brilliant engineer on the team and you know oh my gosh because we've got this person we're or this team in place we're gonna go far you know we're we're okay we're gonna do good because we know that th this is our biggest asset um so this is kind of how you want to start mapping out what your business would look like for a product or a service. You can do this for either or because it all relates to the problem and the people that you're serving, right? And what I would encourage you to do is start with those that you are designing your solution for, your end users. Design, Do this canvas for them. And then I would do one for your key donors, what are the one to, you know, the top three donors, funders, champions of your work that you want to approach? And how, do, what problems do they have? They need to spend money by a certain time. They need to support local, you know, uh, innovation. Everyone's looking at grassroots innovators. Well, that's what you are, you know? So you have to figure out what is it that they need and how are you serving their needs through your project as well? Yeah. And then on the side note, it's just to iterate that you don't wanna fill the box if you don't know the answer. It's better to leave it blank rather than feel like, ugh, I gotta put something down. 
Otherwise, do the second thing, write your hunch, guess, or assumptions, but put it like in a different color. So color code it. So we typically say, okay, everything in red is something, it's a hypothesis. It's something we still need to validate. We're testing, but based on what we know, we don't have any evidence right now, but our hunch is this, but we're gonna go back to our customers, to our users, to our stakeholders, to really research whether that's true or not. But put it in there because your knowledge, your wisdom, stuff you already know, put it up there. But just ask yourself, do we have enough evidence to say that that's true or is that just an assumption we're making? And I think that's really important. The next one is identify what you still need to research to get the answers you need. So what we do sometimes around those assumptions is then we just say, hey, let's do a rapid survey, ask some of these questions and target at least a hundred responses, or let's do a focus group. Let's go out and do a demo. Let's go, you know, let's go talk to A, B or C, you know? So we actually then just write down what are some of the quick ways we can do some meaningful research to get some of the evidence we need to test whether this is true or not. And again, it's up there on a post-it note or a meta card and, and we just stick it up there so that we know that that's, that that's the learning we still need to do. Don't do this on your own. You've got to do this with the team. And sometimes what we do, you might do one version. And then what we do is we bring in some of our potential customers, donors, investors, a champion, and we do it with them. And they will help to refine some of this with you. So do it as a team, but don't do it alone. You definitely need at least, I would say, three people. And you've got to have a team where you're comfortable asking each other critical questions, challenging each other, and really saying, okay, yes, this makes sense. Or give me an example of why you think this is true. And if you have a really good team that you have a lot of trust with, this can become a really wonderful tool uh, for you all to sort of bring clarity to your project. And again, this is what Anna was saying. It's a live document, so it changes. Um, you're, you're constantly revising and iterating and adapting it as you learn more about your customers, your users, and, and how they want to engage with your product or service. So you can add other features, you can pivot based on the responses and sort of the learning that continues to happen. Any questions about the Lean Business Canvas? How many of you feel like it's something you might be willing to try? Yeah, hopefully it's not too scary or daunting. There's um, loads of Canvas templates out there. I would start with the Lean Business Canvas, but there's also you know just the Business Canvas um, out there. The Lean one is a little bit doesn't require it. It's it basically is quick metrics for you to make some quick decisions about your your product or your service. So. It's good for those early stages, uh, businesses that are just launching in. Yes, so this is the format for it. There's loads. What I can do after the workshop is I can share some links. There's YouTube videos on how to um, populate this. There's wonderful, simple websites. I just pulled this from the BM Toolbox, the Business Model Toolbox. Um, and they come in many different languages as well. I know they, we have it translated in Nepali here for our Nepali entrepreneurs. And so it's, it's definitely a tool that, can, that is easy to walk through, easy enough. Um, and then you can, yeah. So Sandra, thank you so much for putting that link out there. Yeah, and I'm just uh, maybe reading uh, what people are saying. Uh, it's well explained, uh, and I will try it once again. Um, and Sarah and Patricia are also saying it's yes, definitely um, Richard as well, um, Helena. 
uh, and also Ira says, great idea, it's not scary. Um, so something in our local hub that Jeff has been doing and reviewing, uh, that's great uh, to see. Thank you all uh, for sharing that. And we will definitely share the slides, of course, after um, the session, like we always do. And yeah, I think I will even also <laughs> create another uh, business model canvas um, for ourselves. And for anybody who's very like, advanced in their um, work um, and very focused on a social business model. Um, there's also a social, social business model canvas. So there's quite a lot of different ones, but if you don't have so much experience yet with it, I agree with Bahar, just starting with the lean business canvas is super useful. Yeah. Yes, and um, and you all will have my contact information too. So if ever you're like, mm, could you just walk me through this? Because sometimes it's helpful to have a facilitator just ask you those key questions. That's what we do in our incubation program with impact entrepreneurs. We just ask them certain questions. We have a guide, and then you know people just plop down certain answers. Um, and and it, it can be quite a nice rapid exercise the first time you do it. And then you go and look at your answers as a team and start marking out the ones that you want to further research. Um, so I'm glad that you're inspired to try it and you're not too frightened or daunted by the task because sometimes these, these tools can be a little, ah, what do we do and how do we do it? But I'm, I'm glad that you're feeling, feeling encouraged to try it. Um, and there's loads of support out there. Okay, so this is one tool for you to figure out sort of a business model for your product or service. And we, but any questions about any of the sections so far? No questions? Okay, then I'll just move on. So when we go back to when we were talking about community, we're gonna do something around community mapping. And what I'd like um, you all to do is maybe use the chat box or unmute yourself just to sort of start mapping out some of these different groups that align with your product or service. So I don't want you to lose some of this thinking, though this is being recorded. I'd love for you to have a clean sheet of paper next to you so you can start jotting down some of these organizations or individuals that you'd like to start approaching um, as sort of champions in the work that you're doing, okay? So let's start with customers and users, right? So who are those people? Don't, and, and don't worry so much if it's a community of customers who don't have the resources to pay for your product, that's okay. But do write them down. Are they mothers? Are they children? Are they disabled youth? Are they um, children in teachers maybe? Because if you're doing education services, really it's about teachers or principals you know, that you're selling. Think about the person who might be really buying this or somebody, if a donor is going to pay for it, who are they paying it for, right? So they're gonna buy the education curriculum for government schools or for schools in a really specific community or neighborhood that doesn't have resources, right? So, so think about what schools, what families, what individuals are your customers and users, okay? And, and you know, sometimes in design thinking, we do personas, right? User personas for some of these folks. So you can do that at some point, but it's really about, these are the folks that I'm, I'm designing my solution for. <laughs> and then your clients. Now your clients can be, I put clients there because some of you might have a product or service that's gonna serve hospitals private hospitals, government hospitals, maybe it's um, you know, some corporate entity, maybe it's the pharmaceutical industry, maybe it's, you know, so you might have a solution that's serving a specific corporate private sector or larger sort of government organization, right? So those are your clients. They're still paying you 
for a service. So depending on the way that you structure your enterprise, if in your country, you know, this is where clients are the ones that you, you would add that to, right? They pay taxes. Those are those. So the whole sort of relationship is designed and the contracts are designed a bit differently because you truly are like a consultant that's serving that client. So think of the private sector or maybe even government sometimes can be your client, hospitals, those types of entities, right? So it's more of your B2B, your business to business sort of organizations and entities, okay? And then your donors and funders, okay? So now if you're working in the environmental space, if you're working in the you know, health space, if you're working around you know, like circularity, which is an area we're working on now, um, financing, access to finance, you know, entrepreneurship or economics, who are some of the key organization donors and funders that uh, are really championing? This is part of their, what they call portfolio. This is what, you know, they always have SDGs that they're focusing on. So you want to know, okay, which SDG does my solution align with and which, which are the donors that are prioritizing this right now? You know, is it UNDP? Is it UNICEF? Is it WFP? Is it, you know, any of these groups? And right now I would say, you know, just put something down as a starting point because then you have a bit of a target audience for starting to reach out to create some communication. We'll talk about communication tools to reach out to some of these organizations and groups. Yeah. So does everybody have a few names out there? Yeah. And under clients or donors and funders, you may have an individual, you know, who is, you know, who is wealthy in your community. Um, if you're designing something for the disabled community, they, they have a commitment, they have a soft spot for the disabled community. So you know their story and you wanna approach them and they can be like a brand ambassador for you or something like that, put them down. You know, these are people that are bringing in um, resources, bringing in their, their network and, and hard money into your into your cause. Yeah? Everyone good? Have a few organizations names and stuff down? Great. The next is in order for you to actually deliver this you need a team. So a lot of times, you know, social entrepreneurs are passionate visionary folks and they want to do everything and they feel they have to do everything and they struggle and they burn out and it's hard. So I want you to list out who you need, you know, where are your gaps? And it doesn't mean you need to, you need to hire a full-time marketing specialist, you know, but maybe you just need to sit down with somebody to figure out how to create your pitch deck. You know, maybe you just need an engineer to really fine tune this, but you don't need them full-time, but you need them maybe at 50%. Just who, what are the, what's your core team look like? You know, what's your core team look like where, you know, you've got some gaps and you've already got some strengths and just list that out. These are the folks that are going to make it happen on your team. And you want to make sure you treat your team well, invest in them and make them part of your movement. They're just as committed. Uh, they believe in your work just as much as you do. You don't have to convince them. They're on board with you, right? Your vendors and suppliers. So, you know, we're a lot of us, are, especially post COVID, we're in a context where the supply chain is really challenging. Where are you going to get your materials? Is there a steady flow? Um, where are the bottlenecks? Who can you count on to supply your goods? Um, this is really important, it's, especially in a country like Nepal, where we are dependent on India for, I think, over 95% of our goods. And so if something, or China, but st it's still India, it was most of it because we had such a fluid border with India. And so the supply chain, we're very vulnerable to how that impacts our work um, and our production possibilities. So it's really important to map out 
your materials and your supply chain because your demand might go up, right? You might get a donor that says, oh, can you get me 500 of those by the end of the year or in six months time? And you're like, you know, how do we design those contracts where they are able to give you a portion, you know, trust you in delivering some of that, but maybe you say, can we pilot this with a hundred? And you've, cause that gives you an opportunity to test your, your supply chain as well, your vendors as well. And then it's your developers and designers. So these are your hard tech people, right? So your engineers, your people who are developing the, the real, they're troubleshooting because as you're getting into the market and you're getting your product and service out, things are gonna go wrong. And you kind of need to be able to fix it and respond to it. And they can be part of your core team, but sometimes they're your, your backend support because they're expensive. So you don't, may not need them full time, right? And so, but how do you engage some of them? And a lot of them, you wanna find the people that believe in your impact and passion. So don't just send out a job description and hire anybody, sell them your passion, the impact that you're making with your product or service and see if they get excited about it as much as you do. Then you found the right fit, right? Because they're gonna, they're gonna co-create with you. They're, when, you're, when you're at the brink of shutting down, they're gonna say, no, 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 we, we, we can figure this out. And they're gonna help figure it out with you. When you, when you bring them together, yeah? So can you all jot down maybe numbers of people you need, who you need, or how you're going to design and bring these yellow community members together as well? And some of you may already have it in place. Okay, any questions around this? Anybody stuck or confused or wondering, hmm, am I on the right track or not? No? Okay. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna invite others to join your movement. Okay, so now we've mapped these people out. Now how, how do we onboard them? How do we get them to, to join us? How do we communicate our work? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So there, in today's day and age, there's so many dynamic ways to communicate, right? What are some ways that you thought about or already have communicated your project to other people? Who can put something either in the chat box or just share it out loud? What are some communication tools you've used? Anyone? Has anyone? Oh, okay. Sorry, this is a different slide. So we're so we're going to invite others to join the movement. How do we do that? And this is something that I had said earlier, right? Is we're going to shift the power dynamic. We are not asking people for money. You've got to really unlearn that, okay? Because as soon as you feel like you're asking people for money, you've already positioned them in a more powerful place than yourself. And you are designing solutions that have immense power and impact. So you are making a huge contribution to building a better world. So do not um, you know, sort of dismiss that because you're asking for resources. So we're not asking people for money. So that is the one thing is that we, we really hesitate because we're like, how do we ask people for money? How do we, you know, it, it, it feels, it's hard. It's hard to do that, right? Um, yeah, so what you want to do is invite others to join your cause, your impact campaigns and your movements. And 
you're going to do that by inspiring people with a sense of urgency that this is our responsibility. This is our collective, you know, sort of calling to address this because of this, this urgent need. You almost become the voice of your users and your customers when you're inviting people to do that. And when you do that with conviction and passion, people will listen to you. People will really listen. So then it's not about asking people for money, but it's about saying, hey, do you want to join us? Because we're building some great things. We're, we're building greatness for a better world, whatever it is that you're doing, right? And the way you do that is you really focus on your purpose and how it aligns with the purpose of your different community members that you've mapped. So all these folks, especially those green folks that you've mapped, how does your purpose and their purpose align? So depending on whether you're talking to hospitals or, you know, those clients, those, those institutions, whether you're talking to donors or whether you're doing sales to individual customers, how does your purpose align with their purpose? And that's where you, that's when people know that, oh my God, we're on the same team. We're speaking the same language. And this feels like a natural relationship. It feels like a natural partnership. And that's what it is. And then People will, people will almost say, how can I help? What do you need? Because I'm so inspired by what you're doing because that's exactly what we want to do as well. And those are the types of people. When you find that connection, then the result can be quite powerful. And it's quite respectful. It's not transactional, right? It's not, can you give me money? Because I need your money. But it's more like, do you believe in this as much as we do? And if they do, then they'll say, what do you need? How can we do this together? And that's partnership. So inspire others towards building a better world and creating impact through your solution. So what you kind of need to do is convince them that your solution has some real possibility, has some real potential and has some real promise, right? And if you can get that across, then you're going to get people to join your movement. Yeah. And really that comes across through communication and communication is extremely powerful. And that is what's going to help you really get the resources you need to get to launch your solution into the market. Yeah. So now I'm going to ask you about communication tools, right? So how do we do this? You're probably wondering, okay, well, how do we do this? And you're all innovators, you're creative folks. You're out there looking at new media. What are some ways that you already have? And someone did put in the chat box, I think, that they said social media platforms, right? Social media platforms are great. Running events, presenting there, providing a platform for others, working in the same field, WhatsApp groups, sending out email pitch decks. Yep. Yep. So slide decks, pitch decks, right? and making them really tight, right? So there's, um, we'll talk a little bit about what are the best ways to structure some of these slide decks so that you make sure you're getting the most compelling information across, right? A slide deck is basically a, a visual PowerPoint and it's usually about, I would say 10 slides maximum. Don't keep them very long because it's, it's just a hook. You're doing sales, so it's hooking them. And you might want to have like a master slide deck, but you're going to customize it based on who you're approaching. If you're approaching UNDP, if you're approaching USAID, you want to do some homework. What are, what are the SDGs they're focusing on? How does your solution align with that? What is their portfolio? Who are they funding? What are they putting resources to? And how does this align with that? And maybe one slide on something like that. Another one that's really fun are videos. You know, so if you have somebody on your team or you can hire somebody to take some of your solutions, which might be really visual, maybe it's a demo that you're kind of showing that this is how this works. Maybe you put in a testimonial, an expert that's on your team that shows that you have the technical capacity to deliver these solutions. Maybe a video, maybe you embed a little bit of a video in your slide deck. You know, so making it as uh, visual and as, you know, sort of compelling for your audience 
the better, right? And then sometimes if you're talking to a donor, they'll say they have a process and they'll say, we need a concept map, right? So then you need to figure out, okay, how do I take some of this and also put it into like a two page concept note with an ask amount with a slight budget. So you, you don't wanna develop a concept note unless it's necessary, unless they ask you for one is my belief because they're not fun to write, first of all. You know, I, I, I like doing the slide decks or the videos and stuff because that brings my project to life. And, and then if they say, can you send me a concept note? Then they'll give you a template. They'll give you some parameters. Then you know, okay, they want a two page or a three page. And then I can pull images and data from my other tools and put it into a concept note for them. But concept notes, I would say do it once at least a donor or a partner, like you know, concept notes or proposal, once they ask for that. Otherwise, make it fun. And, and do the slide decks and the videos, because I think they're much more um, compelling for decision makers. And then they say, ooh, that was really great. Can you now send me a concept note? You know, What do you need to include in these communication tools? First of all, is some data and evidence of the challenge that you're addressing. So that problem statement, you know, on the lean business canvas, what the problem is, what is, you know, what is the, what is some data some really powerful data that tells us that this is a real life challenge that we, we need to address. You know, so it could be economic data. It could be like health data. It could be data on, you know, access to knowledge or information, livelihood data, how people are able, you know, if we're looking at solutions for the disabled, a lot of times we look at how much time is freed up for caretakers. If we empower the disabled community to be a little bit more independent and safe with some of our adaptive tools, then that means that caretakers are freed up to do A, B, or C, right? And that might result into economic development, you know, building household income, who knows? You know, so, so those are some of the things that you wanna look at. And then you're gonna describe your solution in a very simple manner. Remember, you want this to be easily understood. As soon as it gets too technical, you're going to lose your audience, okay? Unless you're trying to hire engineers, you don't really need any, you don't need to go into the technicalities of it because you're just hooking them. If they want more information about the technicalities of it, they'll ask you. But if you can just say, this is how we're addressing this challenge now. This is our solution. This is what we're doing in a really visual, simple manner. And then what everybody loves are human stories of transformation. So walk us through the journey of somebody and how they would use your solution to transform their reality into a better quality of life to you know feeling more empowered and healthier and that they have a voice or they have meaning or whatever it is that you're you're wanting to do and if you can have a real life narrative even great but if it's a slide deck maybe a picture of somebody a quote and their story right so it's a little bit of a brief sort of real life experience of somebody that's engaged and at this point someone should have engaged with your product or solution. And you should have some pictures or some, some way of documenting it. Take a video, take some photos, take some quotes of people actually connecting and how they their situation was transformed as a result of your solution. And those become your testimonials. Oh my gosh, I never would have been able to <laughs> do this without having this product with me. I, I felt like a new person. I've, I've been changed. You know, whatever it is that people say, um, capture those in testimonials. And if you have some real life data, you know, we tested 50 products and, you know, 40 people, 30 people, all oh, they said this, you know, then that's, that's really powerful um, data around even your testing process, you know, what came back. Oops. And then your ask. We always forget this. People say, oh my God, this is great. Well, what do you need from me now? 
right? So we forget to put what we want. How can they join them? What do you need now? And don't be shy. You, you can say what we need to take now our target, our hope is that we get 100 of these out. We have a hospital that is already asking for this. We're working with blah, blah, blah. And we need investment of 50,000, 100,000, 20,000, 10,000. Or we're targeting three partners, each of them to commit 10,000. You see, then it's like you're not even depending on just one person to give it to you right? You're saying we're targeting three. And sometimes these people will say, hey, I'll do it. And I'm going to connect you to a couple other people that I think will join the same cause and movement along with us. You know, so UNDP will say, hey, why don't you approach UNICEF too? Because you're, you're working with children. Um, so they might, they might give you another 10k, we'll give you 10k. And then you've got some seed money to take it to the next level. Right. So you can sort of stage this out and say, okay, we're going to start by targeting these folks. We're going to target these folks, you know, and then you build sort of your communication tools around that audience. Great. So it's, it's basically, so these are sort of the key components and you can put this in a video. You can put this in a slide deck. And then when you've got some of those creative pieces, you'll have a much better concept note that's not just a bunch of boring words and bullet points. You know, Then you can have a photograph of somebody in there, a chart or a graph, some powerful data points that say X percent of people are still you know, sort of living in hunger because of blah, 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 blah. And our solution is around smart farming, you know, whatever it is. So, um, so your ask is really important and put a figure, put a way that people can. And then it's a co-creative process. People will say, well, I can't give 10,000, but what if I gave five? And you're like, okay, you know, is that meaningful? Is that enough? You know, and then you can ask them, well, who else in your network do you think could match that? You know, and that's who believes in this just as much as you do right? Because remember, you're creating a collective movement. You're not asking for money. You're saying, hey, this is really important. Is it as important to you as it is to me, um, to us? Let's do this together. And when you do that in a really inspiring way, people don't feel like it's charity. They feel inspired that they're creating transformation along with, you know, some bold change makers like all of you. Yeah. Any questions about this? No, maybe human stories. Yes, yes. Don't forget the human stories. The human stories are really important. Also, you know, if we look at sort of the human centered design thinking process, it's that user journey. So sometimes someone might not understand your solution that well. But if you highlight it through how someone's experiences with your product or service, and they go, oh, I get it now. I get how a teacher would use this. I get how a disabled person would use this. I get how, you know, it, they, it clicks and it comes to life. So that's what's quite nice about the human stories is it also is like a user's journey through your solution. Okay, so how to structure your ask, and I realize we have about 10 minutes left, so I'm, I'm going to keep this tight, is um, if you're targeting, again, your audience, your customer or user, you want to state the price of the product. Is it a membership or a subscription model? How much are that maybe it's something that they're gonna pay, but at the end, they're gonna save a lot of costs as a result. You know, maybe their medical costs go down, their travel costs go down, their food costs go down, I don't know. Maybe there's some way of you addressing their pain point through your solution, right? Um, same thing for a donor or funder. They're interested in the impact or the problem or challenge you're addressing. So that if you say, oh, you know, 75% of people living in poverty are suffering from A, B, or C, with our solution, we'll bring that down to 50%. We'll bring that down to 35% or we'll reduce that number, you know? So how are you improving quality of life or the environment or how many lives are being saved? And align it with the SDGs because that's pretty much what a lot of these donors, you know, that's the language they speak. 
So go out there and look at the SDGs and see which one of the SDGs your solution is aligned with. And then they'll know that, okay, because there's sometimes they're tracking progress along those SDGs and you're helping them in, meet, in meeting some of those targets. Um, if it's a corporate client, a private sector client, how are you improving their internal systems? Are you helping them to reduce costs, to strengthen their operations or services that they're providing to their customers or to their teams? So maybe you have a really brilliant solution that's really helping them. So it's again, making sure that your customers and your problem is being addressed by your solution and, and what do they need to do to pay for it? You've got, you can't be shy about putting the cost down because otherwise people won't know how they can engage with your product or service. And then you're diluting your business model and you've got to start testing and building your business model to see if it can survive in this market because that's essentially what's gonna help determine your survival and sustainability, yeah? And that's it, folks. Um, that's what I have for you today. Um, any thoughts, burning questions, reflections on what I've shared? Um, we have about five minutes. Please share them out loud or in the chat box and, um, and we can chat about it a little bit before we close. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. That would be a, like a workshop. And I have to admit, when Sandra did say, Bahar, can we do this? And I said, yeah, can we make it really interactive? And, and I would love to see how maybe we could do a virtual workshop and use maybe a Lean Business Canvas on Miro or some virtual mapping tool and see how we can map it out. But it is possible uh, to do this in practice. But even within your own communities, if you have um, like a business support organization and business incubator and impact hub, many of them would be happy to walk through either the Lean Business Canvas or the community mapping process with you as well. Sometimes for me, I have to admit these virtual processes are not as exciting as doing it in person. I would love to gather all of you in a place and just spread our walls up with a bunch of different like inspir inspiring aha moments. Right, Sandra? <laughs> yes, I would love that as well. So as uh, Ricardo asked um, also, like I was doing the same exercise <laughs> and and I love it um, just to, to write things down uh, on paper. So my in an ideal world, everybody would do this, uh, find somebody in your neighborhood, um, find somebody who's uh, maybe also uh, creating new product products, creating new projects, creating services, um, and also find find people in your neighborhood you can uh, connect with. Um, that's super useful. But also, if you do it um, and you share your digital version uh, with us in the uh, group, that would be amazing as well, of course. And in the next check-in, uh, we can speak about it a little bit more. Um, and depending on Baha's uh, time, we can also ask her to join the check-in uh, to share a little bit more. Um, so we can see about that. And yeah, I was just very inspired uh, by your presentation. Thank you so much, Baha. It was really nice. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I just really hope that each of you walks away at least with one or two things that you're like, hmm, I'm going to try this or I'm going to try that. And, and, and this is um, when you get deeper into it, there's a lot of complexity to unpack. Um, but I think it, it, it gives you the courage to say, at least I, I have somewhere to start. Because sometimes we get so afraid of, of knowing where to start or how to start that we're left almost paralyzed and stuck. And I really hope that you, after today, you don't feel so stuck. Yeah, that's super important. Um, and so I would, would just read a few of the comments uh, still from the chat. Um, so Sarah says, thanks so much for this presentation. It was really a succinct overview of planning relationship building and methodologies in a great punchy dynamic way. So I agree completely. <laughs> 
um, and Elise is saying very instructive and uh, Sarah and Patricia is saying uh, thanks so much for this presentation. It was super helpful and you explained everything so well and so logical and it gave us a lot to think about. We really appreciate the time you have given us and critical making. And Ira said, um, I've learned a lot to get into the pitch deck, um, especially testimonials. I haven't been including it so far. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And everybody, okay. if you still have questions, uh, write them down, also share them in the chat. Um, that will be uh, very helpful. And also in our group chat um, later, if we're not in the call anymore. Thank you all so much. Um, you're building amazing, amazing solutions for your communities and you're basically like essential to the way that we move forward. So it's been a privilege to be a part of your process. Thank you so much. Um, I wish you a lovely evening and some people a lovely day. <laughs> And we will publish this uh, very soon so that uh, more people can uh, enjoy it. Great. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a good